I want to begin again by acknowledging that I'm hosting the meeting from the lands of the Darawal people and I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we are all working today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating here today with us. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples, their ongoing cultures and connections and ownership of the lands and waters in New South Wales. I also want to acknowledge that this land was never ceded. Welcome to our second session in um, our evidence talk series. Um, can we go to the next slide, Rosalita, for me? I know that we've got some of us here that were here um, last week as well, or last fortnight ago as well. So this is session two out of three of this particular series. Today, our learning facilitator is Robin Miles, who some of you might know because she's quite well known around the TEI space and um, organizational development space as well. Robin is the director of social equity works, and she also works for the Miller Group as a principal consultant. She's worked for over 30 years in the human sectors as services sector in New South Wales. She's worked in government departments, in higher education and in a private consultant. She's currently providing sector support to TEI services and has also provided support to homelessness services during the reform process. She's an experienced evaluator and a member of the Australasian Evaluation Society and she's conducted many evaluations of both large and small scale projects and programs. She's a passionate advocate for the importance of measuring outcomes to strengthen service delivery and also for the core role that the theory of change plays in defining a program's overarching process for achieving change. So she is here today to speak with us and to, to teach us about theory of change. And I'd just like to thank her for being here and welcome her. And um, off you go, Robin. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. And thanks, everybody. Welcome. Welcome this morning. It's um, wonderful to see so many faces some that I recognize and many that I don't. I'm about to just screen share. So I'll just do that now. So I hope you can all see that. That's the beautiful wedding cake rocks for those of you who don't know, down in the Royal National Park, south of Bundina in New South Wales. And I just thought, given that we all possibly have a bit of Zoom fatigue, I know I certainly do, but this was a nice place to start our session this morning. Um, thanks, Anna, for that introduction. I am principal consultant with the Miller Group and also director of social equity works and probably know some of you from, from the work that we've been doing most recently through NCROSS on the targeted early intervention um, reform process, slow reform process. Um, I would also like to start with an acknowledgement of country. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, uh, the custodians of the land that I'm on, which is a Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect wholeheartedly to any Aboriginal people that are joining us today on this webinar session. Um, I'd also like to just reflect briefly on um, while, we're, while we're doing the acknowledgement uh, around the fact that, um, you know, we are in a difficult situation at the moment with the pandemic and um, the issue of um, access, equal access to Aboriginal communities for the um, Pfizer and other vaccines is, is of critical importance to us all across the community. And um, I'd like to acknowledge all the work that's been done by Aboriginal medical services, um, Aboriginal elders and, and others. I've got some dear friends who are currently working in the Redfern Waterloo community, supporting the vaccine rollout there to communities. So, um, you know, there's a, a long way to go and that's uh, there's always much work to do to ensure that there's equity of provision because we all want to get through this and we all want to enjoy our freedoms again, but certainly not um, when others haven't had equitable access. So I just wanted to make that reflection. And also, as we start today, I'd also like to thank all of you, not just for joining, but acknowledging that you're probably um, stepping away from your core business uh, and that the social services sector has been, um, you know, bearing a, a, a disproportionate, um, well, I say burden, but certainly um, had to take a lead role in the provision of support to community members during 
uh, this pandemic. And also, you know, it's been a difficult few years with the bushfires 2019, 2020, through floods and droughts and, and that, um, you know, I'm grateful that you've all taken the time today to spend an hour and a half looking at the theory of change. So this module is, um, is to support you navigating that outcomes environment. And what we'll be doing is we'll be introducing the theory of change. I'll be going through some key terms and talking about the if-then logic that underpins the theory of change. We've got a brief video. Um, then I'm gonna talk about the X, Y, and Z equation. Look at where theory of change sits within the program logic framework that I'm sure a lot of you have become familiar with recent, perhaps more recently. And then Rosalita specifically asked me to uh, talk about two case studies. So where the theory of change has been developed. So the first case study will be a targeted early intervention service. And the second one will be a theory of change that we developed for a, um, <clears throat> the large partnership evaluation program. At the end, I'm just gonna touch base with some um, generic program logic models, and then we can have a Q and A. So I'm anticipating that this session probably won't go longer than the hour uh, um, and that we'll certainly have a lot of time for a Q&A at the end. So without further ado, the theory of change, the purpose uh, for this uh, webinar. A theory of change is really just a roadmap. Um, it's it's an expression of how and why the things that we do in our services, the programs, the activities, uh, the services that we deliver will lead to a specific change or, or a anticipated change. It's as, really as simple as, as that. Uh, there are some key terms that I just want to raise with you and we'll come back to these throughout the session. The first one obviously is the theory of change. By the end of this session, I'm hope, hoping that you'll have a clear understanding of what it means, where it sits and how you can use it to your advantage. The other is the program logic and the connection between the theory of change and the program logic. Um, inputs, outputs and outcomes. And I'm sure many of you have become familiar with these terms as we travel through the outcomes measurement space. I will make a little proviso. We're linking today the theory of change to program logic, but the theory of change um, can sit with any planning or, or evaluation uh, model that you choose to use. So underpinning the theory of change is something that we like to talk about is the if-then logic. And those of you with any scientific background will be familiar with this, but the theory of change really follows a straightforward if-then logic. Um, if the intervention, the activity, the program, the play group, the um, uh, training program that you design is successful, then the um, assumption there is that it will lead to some kind of change. It's really an articulation of your purpose. Uh, why are you doing one intervention and not the other? Why are you choosing this program above, above another program that you could potentially use to address the issue? Um, and then this is obviously measurable, which is where the program logic comes in, because you're able to measure through this if-then logic um, whether your intervention has been successful or not. We're not going to go today into the de details about um, how you measure, the tools that you can use to measure, but I'm certainly happy to speak with any of you um, post this workshop about the sorts of things that you can do to measure um, the change that you see because I think that's where some people um, become anxious or uncertain. Uh, we're used very much to measuring outputs or metrics or numbers. Um, we're less confident, I think, in measuring the more qualitative uh, outcomes, those uh, changes that we see in, in the people that we're working with. So that's a little bit about the if-then logic. I'm just gonna play you now uh, a lovely little uh, video by our Canadian um, uh, woman who's got a fabulous accent. Uh, it's very short and it just explains that process of, of the if-then logic more clearly. <laughs> Thank you. 
So what is theory of change? It's an articulation of how and why a certain intervention will lead to change. A theory of change should actually be simple. It's just a quick graphic or a couple of sentences, thoughts of your why, your if-then logic, progressing to um, your ultimate solution. Theory of change is important. You really want to question your assumptions. That's what it ultimately helps you to consider as you walk through your logic. So where do we start? Well, you can do a simple exercise using sticky notes. Start with a problem. Imagine you're chronically late to work. So start with your causes, but don't stop there. Keep going until you get to your root causes. Once you've gotten down to your root causes, you can now map out your theory of change. You can take this same activity and now map out a development problem. So, um, an interesting little example of uh, the if-then logic and mapping out a theory of change. Um, you know, I'm watching too much Netflix and I'm getting to work late and I only have to come downstairs from my bedroom to my front room. So <laughs> I might have to relook at what I'm doing, I think. Um, so that's the if-then logic. That's the simple process that you can go through. And as you can see, it's, it's really demystifying this, this idea that it's a very complex thing to do. Um, another way that we like to, to think about it, and certainly Libby and I have um, talked about this a lot over, over time, is um, always starting from the theory of change. Um, starting from the theory of change is a great, great exercise to do in your, in your teams. Um, before you start any new program or intervention. Um, it's, it's a really great opportunity for you all to understand the root causes of the issue that you're seeking to address and, and then really uh, testing the assumptions that you all have um, that you're bringing to the issues. Some, sometimes people come with, with history, um, you know, the program that they've used in the past. Um, uh, there's little evidence for the fact that it works. Um, and so in that testing process, you can identify potentially other things that you've heard from peers or from other people around the sector that are working really well for that to address that specific issue. So it can be a fantastic uh, creative opportunity. And I'm, you know, I think Anna said at the beginning, I'm a bit of, I'm passionate about um, outcomes measurement and the theory of change. And, and this is why I'm passionate about it, because it does allow you and your teams to, to really interrogate what you're doing and come at things in a real uh, sense with a real sense of purpose. So we like to, um, another way we like to think about it is just for the very simple X plus Y equals Z equation. So the X is always the issue that you're attempting to address. Um, you know, whether that be domestic violence, whether that be, um, um, family breakdown, whether that be, um, you know, improving community engagement, whether that be working with um, young single mums uh, around parenting issues, whatever the issue is, um, the X is the point at which you start to identify what that issue is and, um, and really get to the root cause of what that issue is. Then the why is, is our solution. It's that program or intervention that we decide as a group will be the best to address the issue that we've identified. Um, and then the final part of the equation is obviously the Z, is the change that we expect to see. You know, why are we doing, um, why are we doing the work that we're doing? Why are we implementing the program that we've chosen? 
presumably it's to um, to bring about change in the circumstances or um, life experience of the of the people that we're working with. So <clears throat> as you go through, you can either think about it as an if then logic. Some people like to think about it as an x y x plus y equals z equation. Whatever you find is best to um, uh, to hang your hat on, I suppose, in terms of of thinking through what you're doing. This is a nice, simple uh, exercise. I'm gonna go through now a very um, recent piece of work we did with a, with a domestic violence service. Um, they are very experienced service. They've been around for a, for, a, for a long time, but they had had contact with, um, with some of the schools and, and counselors around the fact that in their community um, at this particular time, there seemed to be an increased incidence of young people, uh, young people in schools or young people who are at risk of disengaging from school who are experiencing or, uh, or being exposed to domestic and family violence and that they were ill-equipped in developing healthy relationships. Now, this isn't a new area. It's, it's certainly not something that's, um, you know, particularly groundbreaking in terms of what the team decided to do, but they um, they did partner with the schools to deliver Love Bites, and that is a, a very kind of popular program that's run around the state, and a lot of you will be familiar with it. Um, it does have a strong evidence base, um, and they were they did decide in that relationship building and work with the um, schools and the counsellors, that they did want to put more of an emphasis on the consent side of the um, equation, particularly given the, um, the issues around consent that have arisen in the last two years across Australia. So, so they did tailor it um, in that way for that particular issue. And obviously the Z that they were um, hoping to see as a result of this program delivery was increased knowledge of domestic violence and its impacts. That the young people attending the program could identify their own safety needs and, and risk factors associated with domestic violence. Uh, skills in how to call out behavior that's non-consensual and presents a safety risk. Skills in how to develop healthy relationships. And then finally, and possibly you know, most importantly, was that young people had increased confidence in how to develop um, healthy relationships because it's one thing to impart information, um, support skills development, but um, sometimes the motivation comes from that um, increased confidence. So this is the way that the team designed their theory of change um, as they went forward and developed their program logic. So it can be a very simple, simple, simple exercise, but it, it but to grapple with it properly does take some some time. <clears throat> so that's just an overview of um, the theory of change, simply put. I'm going to look now at um, the program logic uh, and where the and where theory of change actually sits within the program logic process. A lot of you I know have been um, um, required to develop program logics as part of your um, commissioning process with the Department of DCJ. Um, so you will be familiar with, with program logic models and, um, and the theory of change or the mechanism of change as it's sometimes called. For those of you who don't know though, um, a program logic is simply a, a, an evaluation framework. It's a very common evaluation framework. And certainly in the work that, um, that we're doing, both in so social equity works and the Miller Group, program logic is the, um, is the usual framework that we use for evaluating programs. It's also a fantastic tool for um, planning any program or service. So um, it's, it's definitely become a government standard in relation to both program design and evaluation. So that's what it is. It's it's a it's a it's a model. It's a framework. Um, just going through the steps in that framework for you briefly. Um, we normally start in our program logic thinking with with identifying the inputs for a program. Those are the things that go into um, into a program running. Uh, the outputs and activities. The output 
activity outputs are the things that we do uh, for that program or service to run. And then we measure those outputs and we have output measures. Some people call them metrics or performance indicators. Those are the quantifiable measures that a lot of us are very familiar with. And then we move across that logic process to, to start to see outcomes. And normally we look at outcomes in the short, medium and longer term. Um, if we were designing an evaluation framework, it would definitely have short, medium and long term. Um, longer term are obviously um, more difficult to, to, um, to record, uh, particularly given the timing and timeframes for many of the programs that we're working on. In some um, program logics, you will also see uh, uh, an impacts um, space, or sometimes it's referred to as ultimate outcomes. So they might be more um, broader societal uh, changes or impacts that we might be seeing as a result of our program design. And overarching and the logical flow is from the inputs, the activities, we measure our activities and then we start to see those outcomes and impacts over the longer term. But before we get to any of this, the theory of change really sits over the top. We start at the theory of change. We do our if-then logic. We test our assumptions, uh, and we design our activities in the second um, second quadrant to really um, hopefully lead to anticipated change. Briefly, as I said at the beginning, we're just going to touch on what the inputs, outputs, and outcomes actually are. Inputs basically. Speaking are what we invest in a program. Uh, the outputs are what we do and how, and then we measure those outputs. They're the programs that we run, the groups, the events, the activities. And then the outcomes is simply put the change that occurs. Inputs in more detail, you know, the staffing inputs can be staff, the time that we spend, the financial resources that we put into a program, things like the location, the venue. Sometimes we have to hire venues. Sometimes we can use our own venues. Um, there's also transportation. Some people have buses. Um, there's food, you know, all sorts of things. We also like to think in the inputs. Um, and I, I like to remind people that our partnerships are also inputs. And often we get substantial in-kind support from our partners which are also inputs into the program. The outputs, these are the programs that we run. As I've said, the activities, the groups, um, there's a whole range of things that I know people are doing all around the state. Now, the output measures, um, you know, this is a bit of a funny slide, but um, what we've all become very good at across the sector, and, in, in, you know, I certainly worked in education for many years and we were great at measuring bums on seats, numbers of students in, in courses, um, numbers of commencements, um, numbers of times we ran a program. Um, and really, um, <clears throat> it's important to know, but it's not where the really real richness comes. Um, we're really, like to say, measuring the wrong end of the client. Um, those metrics, those quantitative um, outputs, um, aren't actually the change that we see in our clients. And this is the shift to outcomes measurement. And, um, and the outcomes are really all sorts of things that we start to measure in the um, well-being space, economic well-being, psychological well-being, improved social connections. Um, we see improvements in people's um, housing, potentially their health well-being, empowerment, access to employment, engagement with employment programs, their personal safety, the safety of their children, um, access to education and training and social and community um, networks. So these are all the sorts of changes that we start to see. And the changes can also be um, obviously in, um, in behaviours, attitudes, motivations, um, and, and obviously people's circumstances. 
It's interesting when I've been going around um, talking to people in the targeted early intervention space. In 2019, I went down to a service in Minto and the young woman down there was um, absolutely thrilled that, that her service had been um, sort of enabled by this new commissioning process to move to measuring outcomes because she said she'd been banging on at her CPO for five years was the way she put it. Um, and with frustration at the fact that, you know, they were measuring their um, outputs, talking about the numbers of programs, talking about the number of people they provided services to, but she was uh, really keen to move to being able to report more effectively on her outcomes, the outcomes that they were seeing across their team every day, every week, for the people that they were working with. So um, I think it is an important shift and it takes a bit of time to get our heads around, but it's, it's, it's a shift that I think allows people, it actually is quite empowering for teams to start talking about their outcomes rather than their outputs. So now we're gonna move into the case study um, the zone and we're going quite well. So we're gonna have an awfully long time to Q&A this. Um, the two case studies, as I mentioned, that I'm gonna be looking at, one's a theory of change that I've recently worked on with a, a TEI service. And the next one is the program evaluation. So the TEI service that we worked with um, has locations in Southern New South Wales across mo multiple districts. Um, and, you know, they designed their program logics and they were, were keen to do more deep work on their um, theory of change. And then they were going to go back and look at their program logics once they'd done the theory of change work. So that was their kind of agreed process. And they were a terrific group to work with. I mean, unfortunately, it was over Zoom, um, but we did the best that we could under those difficult circumstances. So for the TEI service, the X was that community members in, in the services catchment areas were experiencing multiple personal challenges. Um, and we'll have a look at those a little bit more in, in a minute. A huge number of stresses were impacting on the community and on individuals who were already experiencing um, um, disadvantage. So the why was to design and deliver a range of targeted early intervention programs that will support people in the community to improve the outcomes that they seek. Uh, probably nothing new to, to most of the people that are joining today. And the overarching sort of Z for, for this um, service was that it would lead to improvements for, um, for individuals that would improve their overall well-being and their personal circumstances to enable them to deal with the complex range, range of stresses that they were experiencing. And the stresses, of course, are, will be nothing new to any of you. Uh, high levels of unemployment, low income, high levels of disengagement from school, poor mental health outcomes, high levels of DV, um, intergenerational trauma, family breakdown, loss of connection to culture, high levels of adolescent pregnancy in one of the particular locations was a great concern to them. And then, um, as I've already touched on, the, those additional stresses in 2019 and 2020 of the bushfires and the floods, loss of homes and lives, and um, obviously the impact more recently of COVID-19. So then they designed uh, a series of programs that were based on some things, um, I'm gonna look at the programs next, but based on important aspects for the, for the service, which was understanding the community's issues. They felt very embedded within their community. Um, they'd been operating you know, for many years. They identified strategies that would provide both individual and community strengthening. They were working effectively, they felt with partner agencies and could provide leadership around collaboration, which they also felt was important because something that I identified, which is probably familiar to many of you, is the sense of um, disconnection across the service sector um, that they felt was, um, you know, leading to poorer outcomes. So they were really channeling quite a lot of energy into their partnership work and that collaborative leadership 
um, piece of, the, of the, their program delivery. They also felt it was really important to provide real skills um, and supports to help individuals change their circumstances. So, um, you know, not just, um, you know, not just things that were temporary or, or transient, but things that would actually build sustainable skills um, so that people could face those challenges in their lives. And that this would ultimately lead to changes in both the individual and the wider community. And I should also call out there, they were looking for um, changes to the um, effectiveness of their partnership networks, working together on common solutions, a bit like the collective impact um, model, but, um, but not using that terminology. So some of the programs and services, these will be uh, familiar to most of you community engagement events, um, engaging importantly with the Aboriginal community and elders to make sure that whatever they were doing, you know, met the needs of Aboriginal community, different in different locations. They were providing information, referral and advice, advocacy and support, supported play groups, educational programs and schools, parenting programs, youth services, youth drop in and, and importantly for them, um, a uh, very kind of well-developed youth voice process um, so that they enabled young people to have, um, to contribute to both the design and evaluation of the programs that they were running. So those are the sorts of um, services that they were designing for that, um, the why part of the equation. And this is just a little bit more of an articulation of the sorts of stresses that they had as we're seeing in their community, um, the vulnerable families and individuals that they were um, working with, uh, homelessness, uh, family a breakdown, um, dispossession, um, the impact of colonialism and um, intergenerational trauma, uh, and um, poverty, drug and alcohol issues and, and, and increased mental health uh, resulting from, from, from those uh, challenges. So you get a fairly complex picture here impacting on, on many individuals um, and that intergenerational trauma and, and you know, there's really a compounding effect of all of these stressors on, on vulnerable families and individuals. But they were very keen to, it's interesting looking at this picture because the purple circle, complex challenges, you know, took, took us some, some time to kind of come up what it was that they were trying to, um, to deal with. And that all of these things really, you know, it wasn't about the vulnerability. It, it wasn't about the lack of resilience. It was actually that these are really complex challenges that people are experiencing and that the service wanted to acknowledge that um, the complexity of those challenges rather than focus on uh, more of a deficit model, I suppose. So, so it, was, it was lovely work that we did together and, um, and sometimes the end result can, can seem quite simple, but it can take some time to get there. Um, so the service is working to strengthen the individual's ability to cope make better decisions to address the complex challenges they face. Um, and and that, that, that all of this work, the work that, that the service is doing with individuals will also lead to uh, strengthening of the communities that they're servicing as a whole and the ecosystem that sits around them. And I think by the ecosystem, they're meaning, you know, the other services, government supports, all the things, you know, family, extended family, all the things that go into to the kind of broader, um, ecosystem around both individuals and, and families. So that was the theory of change and that's how we articulated it. Um, it doesn't fit easily into a template, um, but we did get a set of words that could fit into a template. <laughs> but I think the richness of the theory of change is actually in articulating this, um, you know, the strength of this uh, response to, to the needs of our communities. So, we haven't actually tested 
um, the theory of change. But you'll all be familiar. I'll give you a little bit of a few moments to look at some of the changes that they were seeing in clients as, as a result of their program delivery. Um, and I'm sure that most of you are familiar with many of these um, changes or outcomes. So I'll just leave that slide up there for a, for a little quick minute. So stepping away from the targeted early intervention space, um, the second case study that I'm going to talk to you about is for um, the ACT project. It was a program evaluation that the Miller Group was involved with for um, oh, since 2018. Um, and we're still involved. The, the formal part of the program has stopped. ACT is a collaborative toolkit at preparing older people for emergencies. And it's a partnership project with, um, led by Meals on Wheels New South Wales uh, with the a lead partnership from Fire and Rescue New South Wales, from their community engagement team and from in partnership also with New South Wales Rural Fire Service SES and Red Cross Australia. Um, <clears throat> the X, Y, and Z for this, um, this project, um, we started, the X that we started with was that at-risk older adults living at home have higher fatality rates in house fires and are also vulnerable to other natural disasters and emergencies. Now, I think I think it's something like 65% of fatalities, house fire fatalities are people aged 65 or older. And that's um, further compounded by more older people living at home for longer. And that whole sort of shift towards aging in place, which is very, pos is very positive, but comes with some um, increased risk factors. Um, the Y was obviously a program that would uh, enable home support providers, in this case, Meals on Wheels, New South Wales, but it's an extended program that um, has been offered to any Commonwealth home support provider to enable those uh, service providers to have emergency preparedness conversations with clients um, in their homes and refer them to existing emergency service programs. So the Z was obviously the increased preparedness for at-risk older people. Um, increased knowledge of local risk factors and how to prepare well. Increased capacity of the home support providers to enable their clients to improve their safety and preparedness. And also importantly, and this is something to bear in mind when you're working in partnership, Often your theory of change and your program logic will have um, changes and outcomes for partners who engage with you in your, in your work. So for the ACT project, one of the anticipated changes that we we're all hoping to see was improved partnerships between emergency service providers. So fire and rescue, RFS, SES, with, um, with those Commonwealth home support providers, with Meals on Wheels providers. Um, they all intersect when there's a, a natural disaster or an emergency. Um, certainly was the case in the bushfires in 2019, 2020. Um, but there's, and there's a great deal of respect for one another, but there's, um, there wasn't a strong uh, understanding of each other's um, worlds or core business um, or even um, the sort of terminology and the sorts of things that those both those service sectors are dealing with. So it was anticipated that, that this project, this long-term three-year project would lead to improved partnerships at the state and local level between those partners and that knowledge of each other's core business. So Again, that's, that's just the summary of, of, 
of what we're expecting to see as a result of, of the program. Um, and the program actually involved establishing partnerships. A lot of planning and needs assessment went on in the beginning. Um, speaking to Meals on Wheels providers, finding out what they actually needed, how they worked with their clients, developed a train the trainer for Meals on Wheels staff and volunteers so they felt confident having emergency preparedness conversations so that they understood that they weren't responsible for the safety of, of all their clients, but that they could actually begin the conversations um, with their clients because of that pre-existing trusted relationship they have with them. Um, then there was the design of the home visiting um, emergency readiness discussion tool that would be used with clients and, and an app that's actually downloadable um, and some leave behind resources and key messages for clients. And then obviously we moved into a piloting and evaluation phase for the project. So through all that design and development process and then the piloting, the theory of change and the program logic kind of traveled travel with us and the steering committee and the working group reflected on the program logic and the theory of change over time just to see what was was happening um, it was obviously looking to build capacity in the services change the capacity of um, the service partners um, both staff and volunteers increase their knowledge and skills in how to identify all hazard risks Importantly, refer clients to um, relevant partner programs because there are a lot of really good programs that are already available and um, enable those staff to have uh, conversations, gentle conversations that would encourage action um, for older people living at home and all based on a wellness and rehab model that was at the core of that Commonwealth Home Support Provider uh, process. So that's the theory of change that we set up for the ACT project. And we did have three years to, um, to you know, see it through. The outcomes that we were seeking for older people is obviously also an understanding of their local risks, an ability to take action, and a sense of preparedness for both the clients and also often for their families and carers who were invited to be part of those conversations. And ultimately um, to increase people's capacity, decrease their risk and vulnerability to natural disasters and enable them to continue to live safely at home. Um, now Rosalita charged me with picking two examples, one that you know had been tested and had been modified uh, with this project, you know, we did see it over the three year time frame. The theory of change actually didn't, didn't change very much or at all. And, and the reason probably for that is that the theory of change was designed in late 2018 when the partners all came together as a steering committee and we had a series of workshops to actually identify the theory of change. And everyone, you know, engaged with that process wholeheartedly and I think probably bears witness to the fact that you know quite considerable thought went into the planning stages for this program so the theory of change was was fairly um was fairly strong and robust um but that's not to say that the program logic which I'm showing you now and I'm sure you can't see all of the details there but this is just um to show you the the program logic that was designed with the inputs, the activities, the output indicators and the outcomes, both short, medium and long term for the, um, for the pilot, particularly up to the post pilot phase. And, and if you have a look at the outcomes, you can see there are, um, there are outcomes for pilot staff, outcomes for clients, outcomes for an emergency service partners, um, in both the short, medium and long term. Now, the thing that did change about our theory of change program logic process was that this program logic got reviewed regularly every six months um, and, and did go through a radical you know, rework. Uh, some of the inputs changed, 
some of the partners changed, um, some additional money was sought, uh, the resources that were developed were quite radically different at the end from the ones that we imagined at the beginning. So I'm popping this up and really um, focusing on it just as a way of letting you know that your program logic is a living document. Um, I know it looks like a template and it looks dry and dreadful, but actually it's there's a process that you go through where you can review it, you can update it, you can see if things have worked or not. And if they haven't worked, you can change them out. You know, it, you're not locked forever into what you put in your original program logic. Um, but you are trying to test your theory of change. So it's good to go back to that and, and, and stay with that and then change the content of what you're doing to make sure that you do get the change, get to the change that you want. And again, it's that process of purposefulness, I suppose. It's, you know, if this isn't working, let's try something else. And a constant kind of course correction, as it were. So um, the theory of change in this, and, and program logic in this process, in this project did help us improve the program over three years. Um, you know, we found out, for example, from the pilot sites that they need, two of them particularly needed community translations of the leave behind key messages. So, so that was um, included in the process. Um, they also asked for a, an app it was originally a discussion tool that is um, paper-based and um, a training manual. So we worked with a web designer, an app designer, and um, they designed the ACT Home Visiting Emergency Readiness Discussion Tool, which is downloadable, and some services prefer to use it that way. Um, it also allowed us to be flexible in how the Meals on Wheels teams in the five pilot locations delivered, because some of them couldn't deliver um, in, in the kind of way that we'd anticipated the program should be delivered. And the feedback was definitely that, you know, we needed greater flexibility in how people could deliver that program. So as I said, we did revise that several times during the development process. So that's just a quick overview of two pr programs, two, two, a service and a program where um, theory of change and the program logic has been used um, throughout that design, planning, delivery process and evaluation. Just a little touch base on, on changes. I think, as I said earlier, you know, they're harder to measure, but it really is where where you'll find that the rewards are. Um, those outcomes that you see in your clients, increased well-being, increased connectedness, an increase in knowledge, decrease in risk-taking behavior perhaps, or a decrease in the impact of, of an immediate crisis, um, improved stable housing, all these sorts of things. Um, while they're not as easy to measure as how many people go through your programs, it really is where um, it's it's much more rewarding to measure. And um, we're again looking at changes in people's knowledge, attitudes, motivations, behaviors, and circumstances. Now, as I said, there are lots of tools that are available to people. Um, so, so that's really important um, as you're going through. And I would make the um, make the strong point that in designing the theory of change and developing your program logic, it's really important that you engage as many people across the organization as you can in that process. Um, a theory of change um, is as good as, as, as the people who can get involved in testing it. Um, as I said, the, um, the ACT program, that was you know, fairly good practice. We had, you know, 15, 20 people around the table workshopping what went into that um, theory of change for that program. And, and that's why it was so robust and that's why it was um, successful. So I'd encourage you to not do these things in isolation. You know, it can seem like a ticker box sometimes, but culturally it's a really great way of engaging your, your teams and your staff 
in um, in building a real understanding of the benefits of outcomes measurement. So that said, I'm just going to touch base, and this is something I know that Anna Anna asked that um, I just touch on briefly. Um, some examples of the program logics that you might have seen. Um, just to allay your fears or, or concerns about different models, uh, different templates. Um, I don't want to end with a template mentality. But I don't want to end with a kind of um, compliance um, model, but but it is important that we acknowledge that these things are out in the um, public domain. This is the targeted early intervention program logic. Um, you'll see it's got some different terminology perhaps than some of the um, terminology that I've been using, um, but the current situation is obviously the, the, the needs or the issues that you're addressing. You've got activities and services. They're also asking people to look at the evidence base for why they're choosing the activities and services. Outputs are obviously the, the measures of those activities. They've got a spot for um, the theory of change. And then there's on the right hand side the client outcomes. The SHS program logic template that I know a lot of people are using is slightly different. Again, it's got the current needs and situation, it's got your program activities. They're talking about mechanism for change. Um, but just a, a word of reassurance please don't get hung up on the terminology. It, they're all generally in essence the same. Mechanism of change and theory of change are interchangeable. Um, and in this um, model, you see the short-term, medium-term and longer-term outcomes columns on the right-hand side. So it's a little bit more standard. Um, uh, the, the kind of standard program logic that I know Libby and I would use in the Miller Group and in any of the work that we're doing, is uh, more the inputs, activities, output indicators and outcomes, um, the short, the medium and the long term. Now, this is the one that I showed you earlier. Um, uh, and we would normally start from that inputs part of the of process. But overarching it all is the theory of change. Um, it's not it's not something that we see embedded in our template. And I would really encourage you to, even though that you've seen it plopped in a template, the theory of change really is the starting point. It's the place that you do your most creative work and together with your team and as many people in, in the organization as you can engage in this process, um, you can work through that creative thinking around the purpose of why you're doing what you're doing. So we have come to the end of the presentation and now we have a and a if people have questions. Can you see, thank you, Robin. Can you see the questions in the chat? No. I haven't been looking, no. I've no, been... no, I, I just meant now. Um, so oh. we've, got a, we've got a few questions. Um, shall we start with the ones that have emerged in the chat first? Do you want me to read them or do people want to read them? Is Tamsin still here? Yeah, sure, I am. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Sorry, I'll put my video on. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Great. Thank you, Robin. That was awesome. Um, can you see me? Hi, Tamsin. Yes, I hi. can see you now. Hi, how are you? Thank you. Good. Um, I just had a question. You said that... Um, it's empowering for teams to talk about outcomes, and I can imagine so. So how would you normally facilitate that? Wow, that's the golden <laughs> question. <Yeah. laughs> talk to me afterwards. No, um, look, it's very, very simple, Tams, and I think it's just, um, you know, I think if you go through that process of, you know, what is the need you're addressing and who are the people that, you know, need your program or support or service, and then get the team to talk about the sort of outcomes that they see from the work that they do currently. Right. Um, you know, you can you can frame it in the context of the human services outcomes measurement framework. You can look at you know safety or home or those sorts of things, or you can just have a a really frank unpacking of the sorts of outcomes that people are seeing. Um, I did it just the other week with 
with the domestic violence service I'm working with and you know I got stunned silence for the first minute over zoom and they kind of looked at me and I said well you know what sorts of things do you see with the women that you're working with you know what sort of changes and they went oh increased self-care increased self-confidence increased safety and blah 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 you know like and then it's then then it started to unfold and it was just affirming I think it's very important that you affirm what people say you know um and then you can kind of group it in terms of you know it might they might some of the um outcomes they're describing might fit under different kind of categories if you want to go that far but it but it is a really great um great opportunity and and um and another another example of bad practice i guess that i can give you is by way of cautionary tale is um i i worked with a service a couple of years ago and the ceo said came into the room and said oh look you know just just tell us how just tell us how we map these against the score domains in the tei thing you know and then we'll and then we'll know what we're doing and and, and everyone kind of looked a bit shocked and um it didn't work you know because that closes people down if they feel constrained but if you actually let them describe what they're seeing because that you know you're the experts mm -hmm. i'm just talking to you about a process but you're the experts and your staff are the experts in the outcomes with clients so once they get going and they feed off each other, you know, you probably won't be able to stop them. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And then, you, and, then, and then you can post, you know, you can post, post rationalize. You can kind of attach that then, go back to look at something like the score domains and say, well, what is that? You know, where does that sit? Where does that fit? Where does self-care fit? You know, where does improved safety fit? And, 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 and you'll find a place for them. Um, but but I prefer to let people speak pretty freely. Brilliant. Thank you. Pleasure. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> There's another question in the chat from Marie Earl. Is she here? Yes, hello. Go for it. <laughs> um, hello, uh, Robin, thank you for that. It was really interesting. Um, one of the things that um, when we talk about qualitative and quantitative, um, sometimes services, and I, I like your um, story about the CEOs, they can be very much wanting numbers and, you know, um, and if you start talking about, oh, this is, you know, people are feeling, you know, better, more empowered, more engaged with services, they sort of, their eyes glaze over sometimes and they want to know, you know, data, data, data. And how do you work with that? Um, it can be really hard sometimes to get them to sort of change their view on, you know, looking at outcomes as, the, you know, the way to move forward. And, you know, we're look, looking at person-centred um, services and, you know, outcomes have to be the way that we measure that but yeah how do you work with calcitrant people that don't want to go in that direction or bang their heads together in a room <laughs> no yes. Marie no that's a good question and I don't mean to be flippant um but um look I think sometimes I find working with services that the best place to start is with governance um and um sometimes it's it's you need to um run a session with the board or the management committee and, 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 and let them know about the shift to outcomes measurement um, and, and, and how that will impact on the service more generally. And, and that will involve the CEO or the senior managers, or you could do it with the executive team, but, but it, it may need to be addressed because you're right. Um, and I think that that's what I was saying um, earlier on in the, in the um, webinar is that um, we're very used to measuring numbers and we feel safe and comfortable measuring numbers because it's kind of easy to do. Um, you know, SIMS measures numbers. Um, a lot of the databases that we've all set up measure numbers. But if you've, um, and I don't know what space you're working in, Marie, are you in the, what, are you TEI or SES, SHS or, or something completely different? Yes. Health. To that. Yeah, yeah, health. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, so look, you do have challenges in, in the health environment because I know that um, 
you know, a lot of epidemiolo epidemiologists kind of <laughs> run um, run some of the data, but 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 there's a big shift there as well. And and I know that Libby did some excellent work last year with um, um, the violence, abuse, and neglect um, strategy in health around how to how, how to look at research and how to look at action based and and patient led experience to drive that kind of um, evidence framework. Um, so I'm sure, um, you know, she could have a conversation with you after this about how to um, leverage your senior management <laughs> um, to a more outcomes um, measured approach. But, um, but short, of, short of briefing them properly on the shift, um, you know, it, it is quite hard. But also there are a lot of tools and processes and approaches that are available to you if you, you, know, you want to give them um, better, better outcomes measured, measurement um, that will take away the fear, I think. Um, and, and yeah, so we might need to talk offline about some of those resources that might be available to you. Happy Thank to do you. that. Thanks, Robin. Thank you. Not easy. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, I can see that Roseanne is here. <laughs> Do you want to ask your question, Roseanne? Thanks so much. Um, and a great session, Robin. Um, I just wanted to ask, we've got a community of practice at Catholic Care Wollongong um, where we're really trying to develop this framework across all of our service areas. And we've done a lot of the mapping of our program logic and theory of change. But the big stumbling point that we have at the moment is um, the, uh, the tools. And one of the questions I wanted to ask about is um, we, we do use some evidence-based tools, but is it appropriate to ever develop your own sort of assessment tool that's not actually being tested or evidence-based, which directly links the outcomes that you're trying to measure so that it is, you are very confident that you're measuring what you actually set out to measure? Look, I'm not a, uh, look, <laughs> I can tell you what I think. Um, it might not be the funding body's <laughs> um, version, but, but, but absolutely, absolutely. If you can work through a, a design process that, that's really robust, um, you know, there's kind of an emphasis on validated scales and tools that have been validated, and, and, and that's all very important. But if, if you and your team um, are able to carry that through uh, effectively and, and, and work, it's complex work to do, mm. um, challenging work to do, but, but hats off to you if, you can, if you're going to take it on and do it. Um, absolutely. You might want to get someone to, to check it for you, you know, someone to work with you on, on that uh, sort of um, independent external checking process just so that you haven't missed anything. Um, but but absolutely, you know, all power to you, Roseanne. Yes, well, it, it's in its infancy at the moment. So, we'll, um, yeah, it's one of those things where we've used tools in the past, but they weren't properly linked to the program logic theory of change and they were actually, we actually weren't successful with them. But then when you try to find one that actually is linked to what you're setting out to achieve, that's where we've sort of had a few stumbling blocks. Yeah, look, I think that's really great. And, and certainly in, you know, an uh, Aboriginal um, evaluation space, you know, they're, they're always designing tools that are relevant. I mean, I did some work with um, with a Tabwaba Aboriginal Medical Service and, and also uh, um, Mie Bure up in Moree. And, you know, in talking through some of the, even the language that's embedded in the targeted early intervention um, thinking, you know, we're talking about age appropriate development. Well, mm. what does age appropriate development look like in um, in kinship, um, Aboriginal kinship um, setting? You know, what is a f what is family functioning? These are these are very kind of um, you know white middle class assumptions underpinning some of this. So so I think you know obviously testing and developing things that are more appropriate is really important and powerful. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly true. And I think our challenge has been when we're trying to um, use tools with young children in our unschool counselling setting or um, for people with a disability, um, it's very hard to find a tool that um, caters for their needs. That they actually Toads, I'm going to need help, Cody. I can't do the dog and listen to this oh. and do that. So can oh, you help me, please? Will you get the feed? <laughs> Christy, your iPhone's on. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, you were saying? 
I, I, I was your... just saying, sorry, I'm taking up your time, but I was just saying no, no, that no. we're working with um with children and with people with a disability, often the tools that we're um we've found that could help us to measure the outcomes are not accessible to those um, to young children. And that's a bit of a stumbling block. So we've, that's what's led us down to creating a tool that actually caters to their needs. Mm, beautiful. It sounds really exciting, Roseanne. I'd love to chat to you about it further. Yes. I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. definitely stay in touch. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, 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 no. That's really terrific. I, I do. And I think, you know, um, you know, we, we did some evaluation work with, um, uh, a mentoring pro program with um, young people in um, Aubrey a few years ago now, and um, and at that point the funding body was saying to them, you know, use the use the um, personal wellbeing index. Exactly, and, that's we use know, that one. Yes. PWI, you use the PWI, you know, blah blah blah, and um, you know they were finding with the young people particularly, um, they were coming in, you know, and they were supposed to use the, the PWI at the beginning. Yes. And at the end of the intervention, yes. and at the beginning of the intervention, when they used the PWI, they were finding that young people, were, well, there wasn't a trusting relationship. Exactly. So what, what young person comes in and goes, oh, yeah, I'm feeling really terrible. Like, this is my life's falling apart. So they tended to get people coming and go, oh, no, I'm pretty OK. I'm just, everything's all right. I had, you know, I had played some pool last night and had a few beers with my mate. So I'm feeling quite good. I'm a four out of five or whatever. Um, and so then they actually found when they ran their intervention, they got a big dip. You exactly. know, because people actually were, you know, building trust, you know, talking honestly and openly more about what was going on in their lives. And, you know, some of it was really um, very deep sort of trauma and, and, and difficulties. So, you know, they were going down to ones and twos and, and the funding body was going, what's this program's rubbish? You know, yes. what are you doing? Um, so it's been, a, and then you've got to go into a negotiation process with your funding body and you've got to explain, you know, Whenever you start to, you know, run these processes with, with actual people, you know, you, you, you can fall foul of, you know, personal bias and all sorts of things that, you know, who's going to say that their life's shit in the first five minutes of a conversation with someone, exactly. you know, really? Yeah. Actually, yeah, we had we use the PWI, and what you've described is exactly our challenge because it's it's also not trauma informed either. If you're working with a young person in a lot of distress and you're asking them questions that can trigger trauma in those very first few minutes of actually working with them, so yes, so you've actually that's exactly been our experience. Yeah, no, I think it's a very common shared experience. It's interesting though because you know I, I, then I met you know soon after that I met a drug and alcohol counsellor who swore by. Um, a modified version of the PWI that he was using with with his um, clients, patients, or yeah. you know, whenever he saw them, and he was finding that it was quite a useful tool. Um, so I was very keen to hear from you know, like it's, always, it's important that we share as a collective, I guess, shared experience about what's working well um, and where it works well and in what context it works well, because some things work fantastically well in in perhaps a more clinical setting um, than in a social service setting too yeah. so yeah interesting very yeah. interesting thank thanks Roseanne thank you good luck oh thank you <laughs> we had another question from Kate 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 hello Kate um, hi. Hi. hi hi sorry <laughs> I, I just have a question around that slide where you have the program logic and you have separated outcomes from out, um, impact. And I know that you said not all program logic would have that, but I'm just curious to unpack a little bit what's the difference between the two and also how do you actually not, not measure them, but how do you express them in the program logic? Kate, you're really echoey. Is there some way you can turn that off? I just oh. didn't quite catch all of that. Um, um, you were talking about impacts? Um, yes. yes. So that's okay. I'm not quite sure what I can do. Maybe, Maybe I'll, I'll just type, type in the chat. chat. Sorry about that. that. No, no, okay. no, that's okay. In the, in the chat, Robin, it said if this is helpful, Kate, can you please explain the difference between outcomes and impact in the program logic? Is that yeah. kind of Look, what you have to care? Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's yeah. Look, I know it's confusing and um, I... I you know, I was tossing up whether I popped that in there at all um, because, you know, when we were doing the work with health, I actually think that in, in the program logics at health design, they actually have, they talk about outcomes as impacts. 
So I don't want to skip, frighten the horses, but um, so it, it does depend on the setting, Kate. And if you're working in the health space, you may have seen a program logic where actually they don't have outcomes, they have impacts um, is this, as what they're measuring. Um, now with, um, with a pure program logic, you know, when we do it, we don't talk about impacts, we talk about um, longer term and ultimate outcomes. So we stay with that outcomes terminology. But I know that some people do, you know, it's, um, it's interchangeable really. Um, your ultimate outcomes tend to be the things that you would see across populations. So I know with the targeted early intervention reforms, what the government, what DCJ is hoping to see in those longer in that longer term um, outcomes space are impacts for the community. So they're more population impacts. So, um, you know, reductions in um, rates of domestic violence, reductions in children in um, out of home care. And that's kind of the driver of the reforms. Now, there's just no sense that they are holding individual services responsible for those changes or uh, those outcomes, um, but they are hoping to see that as a longer term impact. So really it's sort of longer term and, and, and broader impact rather than specific outcomes for your clients um, at a personal level. That's how we would talk about an impact. Um, I'm having muddied the waters there by saying that in the health context, I think they use um, impacts interchangeably with outcomes. So is that, is that clear as mud? Yes, thank, thank you, you very much. much. <laughs> no worries. So we're done with, unless I've missed something, we're done with the big questions in the chat and Rosalita is just um, launching the poll. So I also wanted to know, does any, are there questions from the floor? Does anybody have any questions that they didn't want to type and just want to ask? I'm looking for hands. Any? Annie, thanks, Robin. Hello. Um, hi, Robin. Hi, I'm, Annie. I'm actually employed as an adolescent and family counsellor and um, funded under the TEI funding, um, as are many adolescent and family counsellors across the state. Um, we were, we've been around, AFCA has been around for a long time, and originally they were funded under... Uh, whatever, to reduce homelessness and to um, work with young people to, to reduce homelessness. That was one of the, the original things, and they were attached to refuges and things like that. Mm. Um, that's changed over the years, of course, and then with this TEI funding. And the difficulty that, that I have with, with the, um, the program logic per se is on the outcomes measurement itself because you don't, tend to see outcomes for quite some time. Um, you may not even know when you've finished providing a counselling service for a six-month period, even longer, um, that they may come back to you. You know, you'll see a child that's 14 and then, you know, I've got young people that keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back. So there's been changes, but they're, they're, the nature of the intervention from the start um, is often so, you know, steeped in so, so much trauma that they've had that I don't even really know how to measure measure that. The tools that we use, obviously, um, clinical tools, which are really hard to, to put into the data system that we've been given to recording. Um, so we're having difficulty understanding how we actually um, how we actually show what we do basically. Uh, so we can write it down in a program logic and we can do all of that. And I'm quite happy with that, but it's really kind of cherry picking things and, and not really knowing whether, um, you know, whether what we're putting into that exchange is showing anybody what the adolescent and family counsellors across the state are, are doing. Yeah, wow, well, Annie, that's a big one. Um, no, and I, and I a number of services I'm working with do have um, counsellors and psychologists, you know, attached to their TEI work. And, and I take my hat off to you. I know it's really kind of very important work that needs to be done. Um, 
in talking this through more recently with a, a colleague in, in Marrickville who's doing your work and, and had shared your concerns, um, we talked about some of the more subtle outcomes that you're seeing, that the, the small outcomes, not these sort of larger, longer term outcomes, but, you know, she was, you know, speaking with some frustration really about TEI. Um, and what became apparent was that actually engaging the young people that she was working with and having them come either face-to-face -face or Zoom or outreach, you know, when pre-COVID to people's houses, you know, whatever the um, service setting is for that work, actually maintaining that engagement was a huge outcome. So sometimes I think we have to shift our, how we think about the work that we're doing or, or the outcomes that we're seeing. And actually, you know, if the young person has developed a rapport with you, that's an outcome. You know, if they're maintaining their connection with you, I think that's an impressive outcome as well. And, and sometimes it's just holding a young person, isn't it? Or, or anyone yeah. that we're working with, well, holding you know, them, being there with what you do, 70% is the relationship, isn't it? Or 75 that's right, yeah. yeah. And I think um, certainly, um, you know, in the work that I was talking about with the um, mentoring program with young people, you know, again, sort of very traumatised young people, you know, and the mentors were saying, oh, God, how do we know if we're doing good? You know, how do we know if our outcomes are good? What, well, you know, they're getting all panic-stricken about it. And and the young woman who was running it just said, well, look, if they're turning up on the, you know, if they're on the street corner waiting for you to pick them up every week, then that's a positive outcome <laughs> because actually getting that engagement with young people is can be really um hard to maintain and, and yeah. so and I guess we know that but I wonder you know like I when I feel in the the, the data the decks um I'm you know what's family capacity building I don't even know what that is you know like <laughs> I hope I'm doing it all the time <laughs> yeah yeah um, look I think I think what we decided with um certainly the service in Marrickville was that there were a few kind of domains sorry for people who are not TEI familiar but domains that that she was going to use regularly and I'm happy to talk to you Annie about that offline perhaps I can yep. give you a little bit of an overview of what she's doing exactly yeah. what she's using and how she's how she's going about her measuring because we well that'd be lovely Robert yeah. I'm actually the AFCA chairperson in New South Wales and I'm getting lots of people asking and I'd really like to have some some semblance of um information to, to pass on to the other actors. yeah look I'm happy to talk to you about that Annie I think it's a really important area and it's and it's it's kind of one of those small specialized areas within it that's so important but it's kind of it, it is can be very um obtuse what how you report that stuff so I'm happy to talk to you about it thank you yeah pleasure <clears throat> anybody else can I see any other hands Um, yes. Oh, yes, Lou. <laughs> um, I'm with Family Inclusion Strategies in the Hunter, and uh, we work with uh, parents and family who've had their children removed and placed in care. And a relatively new program for us is um, peer support provided by parents who've navigated the system themselves. And a couple of the um, main types of support they provide is support at court and support via a free phone line. And, um, and they also do morning teas with parents. Um, but one of the issues we have is how do we evaluate this, what's been called light touch, right? So, um, you know, people are in the court foyer waiting to go into court for a care and protection matter. Um, our peer support workers will, will drop in and chat with them or just let them know they're there. They might just check in with them again when they come out of court um, and they're on the phone. And so it's a passing connection and we can definitely they're doing a survey for how many people we see and how long we see them for but it's so brief and also it is uh court especially is at a crisis time and it is where there's a preoccupation with a whole lot of other things so it's actually unreasonable to check in with people about how they found the peer support which was quite minimal so we're challenged around evaluating where you know, uh, I think Annie was talking about prolonged time with people and where do you kind of mark your outcomes? Where the other way in terms of it's just this brief experience. Um, so we're yeah. quite 
And then we're having trouble then looking for grants because we can't articulate that. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Who's your fund? Who, who, who do you get funding from? Uh, we, we, we get little grants. We, we, we just got 15,000. Well, last year we got 15,000 from Sisters of Charity. Um, we've got a private donor that gave us 20,000, but we, we've got nothing substantial. Mm. Um, we get larger grants, but we don't get. I mean, the other issue is when we ask for money, we're asking for money for people who've had their children removed through due to child protection concerns, which is difficult for a broader audience to, um, you know, it's not palatable, if you like. Yeah, look, we might need to have a chat after this, Lou, because it's okay. quite specific what you're talking about. Um, and, and yeah, I'll, I'll, we, I just think we might have to have a conversation about it, really, because okay. it's a little bit in depth But for, for, for today. But I would say that, um, you know, the work that we've done up in Mori with um, Mie Bure, they do have a court support program, mm -hmm. and we've designed a program logic for that. Um, so there are some models that, you know, potentially we could share with you. Um, uh, and um, But it is very hard if you're only light touch. And mm -hmm. I think certainly in the targeted early intervention space, the areas of light touch in that program that are funded by DCJ, um, you know, they don't have to record outcomes for. It's just outputs because, you know, information referral and advice you know, people come in and out the door. Well, if it's domestic violence service and they're doing information referral and advice, you know, they're not even collecting names, you know, that's, there's privacy issues. So, so they're not expected in that context to measure those outcomes. Um, so we might just need to have a bit more of a conversation about what you're doing. Thanks. We also have David and maybe, God, we've got a lot of time, Robin, for finishing early. <laughs> Um, so, um, David, do you want to ask your question? And I will offer some apologies for the background noise. I think workmen have just started next door. So I'll turn my uh, Thanks very much, Anna. My, my question is, uh, is about uh, the software systems and the data systems. It was alluded to by a previous question. So when every program has uh, different outcomes and when the outcomes are all measured in slightly different ways with slightly different metrics, how can the software systems possibly keep up? Because they, even up until now, our experience of off the shelf systems is that they don't even come close to meeting our measurement and reporting needs. Um, look, that's that's a perennial issue, isn't it? For, for services across the state. I mean, I mean, I think designing a program that is going to fit all the requirements of all the funders because you're right they are all different some of the service some services have got health funding ti funding you know all sorts of different pots of money um and they all do have slightly different um requirements i mean look i i can't really you know tell you where to go um there are i know there are some um firms that are designing um good products um, but I'm certainly not going to spruik them <laughs> on a webinar. Um, but I'm happy to talk to you afterwards, David, if you if you want some suggestions of, of where to potentially go. Um, services have used them and got you know got alignment to things like the data exchange, and they can just they can use their own um, client information management system, and then they can upload directly to the data exchange, which is pretty good. Um, and that's been guaranteed. And I've kind of watched that process go through and I've actually seen that it, it does, they can use their own client information management system because they do have those multiple buckets of funding and then they can upload it to the various portals. But I don't know if every, um, you know, I don't know if every um, um, data solutions provider would do that. And if you were gonna go down that path, that would be something that I would make sure it was absolutely guaranteed, you know. Because you can spend a lot of money on your data um, systems, I know. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Sorry, I, I'm not really a you know. Oh, that's a, okay. That's very not a technical, not a technical person, but but I but I have seen some talks, some products that have been useful. I thought it might be an opportunity as well. I've, I have been asked to do this, if it's all right with you, Robin, on other. Um, on, in every available forum. Many of you may know about tranche three of the Social Sector Transformation Fund. 
as well. So there are a number of providers that are um, have been funded to deliver services, including I, I think David, um, technical support and IT services. So it's worth having a look at that. Just Google, it's on the DCJ website and perhaps you will be able to find, you know, people have been funded to do it. So it's worth a, a conversation. Yeah, no, no, no worries. Yeah, the, um, could, sorry, could you to... just repeat that one again, please? Repeat I can put that. the link, I'll put the link in the chat. So Does that help? I'll, I'll give you an example of the, the challenge I'm referring to. It's not, I'm not really talking about government reporting to DEC. So one of the other questioners talked about using the PWI, but it was yep. slightly customised. Mm -hmm. as, as soon as you do that, as soon as you take, as soon as you take a standard measure like the PWI and customise and, and change one little thing about it, you can't use any off-the-shelf product that, that does PWI. As, as soon as, if you decide that your, your local needs in your community or your, your client, your, your, your group of clients need something specific, you can't use any off the shelf product. You need to customize it yourself. And most organizations don't have the don't have the IT capacity to do that. It's, e it's easy to say we use a customized PWI, but then how do you capture, how do you capture and maintain that data and produce the, and produce the, the, um, the, the, the metrics that you need? I know, you can, I know it's hard to answer, but that, that's my question. <laughs> Yeah, look, I'm sorry, I can't help you, David. I, I you know, I, um, but I know it's a vexatious issue. Um, you know, I, I can only, you know, hope that people can, you know, translate what they're doing into their kind of customer management system in some way. Um, and you're absolutely right. You can't take things off the shelf. Um, there are translation matrices that, um, that the um, that DCJ have done for um, for a number of those standardised tools, but but they are standardised, so they're not they're not where you've customised them as in, in the case that we heard earlier. Um, so if anyone's interested in, in in that document, I'm sure Rosalita can make that available for people. I have been also asked to last call on the poll, everybody. Oh. <laughs> Please do the feedback poll. Rosalita has, has asked me to ask you. I think, sorry, can you hear lots of noise? I think we are at time. Yes. Um, so on behalf of NCOS and behalf of everybody else, I'd like to thank Robin for um, doing a fantastic job today. Thank you. Um, the feedback that I have been seeing has been fabulous in the chat. I'd like to, before the noise gets too difficult for, you, for me, I'd like to thank you all for coming as well. Justin, I see you have your hand up, but I think it's too late. Um, oh, you're applauding. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, if you want to come off mute, everybody, and say thanks to Robin and goodbye to everybody, make a sound before we leave, and please come to the next one. Hope to Thanks see you, Robin. Robin. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you after Thank lockdown, you. everybody. That was great. Bye. Thanks. Have a Bye. wonderful day, Bye. everybody. Lovely Bye. to see you. Bye. 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 Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks, Robin. Bye. Bye. Nice to see people. I love it. Oh my God, more people. It's great.